with me now from a special edition of Crime UK is Jackie Haynes, who served with the Metropolitan Police for 30 years. And Jackie, you've met with Britain's top uh, police officer, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, and discussed this very issue of how to fight terrorism. Yes, I had a, an exclusive sit-down interview with him this week, and I asked him about the threat posed from jihadis returning to the UK and how he was dealing with it in the Met. This is a difficult time. We're seeing great global challenges in Syria and Iraq that are having some impact on the city streets in London and different you know, countries throughout Europe. We've seen attacks in France, uh, in other parts of in Belgium, we've seen other parts of Europe affected by this. Because of course many hundreds of people from, in fact thousands of people across Europe have gone to Syria and Iraq to, uh, to fight. And of course some people have been radicalised by that whole process. So we've, we've got to react to that change. But I think we also need to maintain a you know, sensible approach to it. How successful have you been at stopping jihadis going abroad and indeed stopping them when they come back? Yeah, we have over the last few weeks. We've actually, I think, four young girls we've taken, well, in one case, I think we took off a plane on the runway. Uh, others we've returned from Turkey, I think, in one case, and people we stopped at the uh, ports here. So that, you know, where parents tell us before they go, that's the time to intervene and if we've got nothing else over today it would be a really good message to get to parents. You may be worried about talking to the police or the security service but surely it's got to be better if you're worried about your child going to a horrible place where they might get killed or get involved in a crime or something, you know, the horrible things we've seen, seen on the media. If you tell us before they go, we've got a chance to do something about it. When they've gone, it's too late. There is no structure in these countries. There is no law. So the only law that matters is a gun that's the sort of country they're going to. So they want their kids to go to that and then suffer the consequence of the violence that these people are meeting out to their own people. Many of the people who are dying in these countries being murdered are Muslims. Many of the people who are being killed are also people who went out to fight and then trying to get home. And then they change their mind, but the people they went to didn't change their mind. There are still the same zealots that we see day in, day out. Is criminalising returning Muslims really counterproductive? You've got to try and discourage people from getting involved in wars and getting involved in committing horrendous acts. We've seen, you know, we've seen these cases of beheadings. I mean, who wants anybody to get involved in that? No matter what their political motivation, no matter what their personal grievance, there's no justification for that sort of behaviour. So surely that, we've got to make sure that we dissuade people from going there. And one of the ways is for the law to say it's a criminal act for you to get involved in those countries. Don't go. What clearer statement can a government or a state make? So that statement has to be made. And of course, if you make that the law, then when they return, you have to investigate it. So these young people coming back, realising they've made a huge mistake, is it really right to criminalise them? But why is that different to bank robbers? They, they knew that it was the wrong thing to do, and they changed their mind later when they got caught, and they wanted to turn the clock back. That's true of all criminals, generally. So I think it's, I, I understand what you mean, of course, this might be a political or a religious motivation. The bottom line is they're destroying theirs and other people's lives. And the best thing people like me, law enforcement, can say is don't do it. And if you do do it, you're putting yourself at risk, personally. You do, you're putting yourself at risk in criminal law. If you carry on and take that risk, it isn't my problem anymore. What more can we do other than advise people don't get involved? So it's that risk that is the deterrent. Yeah. And I think the other thing you know, we'd like to get over to, to the public is is that if they can tell us, not only is it someone they know and they are worried about changes in behaviour, because pe ch people do change their behaviour when they get involved in this type of, of, of crime. You know, if they're becoming more radicalised, their behaviour will change. And on that journey, we need to know. So if people tell us, we will investigate it. And I remember back to the 7-7 attacks, which is now a few years ago, but you know, many people died in those attacks. You remember probably that the, uh, the investigations that were carried out when they went back to the houses where they mixed the bombs, that there were changes. So that there were some men of Asian appearance and uh, there, some of the hair had become bleached. If you looked at the vegetation outside the flat in which they were mixing the cocktail of explosive, some of the bleaching agents had got through the window and had bleached the vegetation. And people had noticed that, but nobody put two and two together. They had somebody thought, it's really odd. And by the way, there's a funny smell coming out of that flat. What's all that about? That's the sort of thing we need to know about. But they do know something's changed. People always spot unusual behaviour. And the best of police work is when someone tells us, we listen. And that's vital that we listen properly. And then we do something about it. 
It's Bernard Hogan how they're speaking to Jack. And Jackie, quite interesting that he was saying that the public also have to play their role, that they should note if they see any changes in behaviour of people that they know. Yes, I mean, it's the police can't be everywhere, nor would we want them everywhere. Um, so it really is um, so important that the public feel able to, to pass on any information that they feel is relevant, particularly in communities where this radicalisation is being um, is going on really in plain sight quite often so I think it's prob you know it's, it's so important that the Muslim communities in particular feel able and feel trust enough in the police to come forward give that information and they will be supported through that if they do so now you've served with the force we served with the force for over 30 years these events in France how has that impacted on, on you well I think it, any serving police officer any ex-police officer is is always brought into that police family and and senses that feeling of camaraderie it's it's part of being involved in in a vocation like that i lost three uh, friends to uh, ira bombing in the 80s and the first place i wanted to be is at work and I think that's what we're seeing in France. We're seeing that sense of community, a sense of camar camaraderie, not just in the police service, but throughout the community, throughout the city. People want to be there to show their support and to actually um, say that those officers didn't die in vain. They didn't die. Um, they died protecting the public. And there are plenty more to stand in, in their place continue to protect the public uh, and that's what makes the job very different from any other okay Jackie for the moment thank you okay.